Hi, I'm Lynn Green, and I'm here at Lauren and Darlene's home in Kona, Hawaii, where we gather from time to time uh, with several friends who've been around Waiwam a long time and provide what we call eldership, uh, some form of leadership and accountability. And I thought, given all the changes that we've had uh, in the last few years, uh, but that's the way it seems to many people around the world, um, I thought this would be a good chance to talk about uh, what our journey has been why we made the changes, and especially to, to emphasize the word of the Lord in this, because that's really what we're about. G God has led us in this, and, and we want to just explain how that is, I think. So my perception is that from the time I first began in YWAM, um, we were more or less eldership-led. It was certainly very relational, um, and my first awareness of that was the appointment of, of an international council in 1972 in, in Munich. Dar, do you have a memory of that, a perception on that? I think Lauren has always helped direct us to have an understanding that we are led by the word of the Lord. And from the very beginning with it being youth with a mission and releasing young people, one of the things we would talk about is we wanted to empower youth. We believed God was calling them to be responsible, so that it would be never right to put up a structure that would take away anything from the empowering of youth, because we were youth with a mission. So his thinking always was, how do we empower others? So quite a few of the elders that were appointed at that time who became the first international council were still in their 20s, weren't they? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Yes. They were the people yes. with experience amongst us. Well, f 58 years ago today, uh, this month, I mean, we were just planning for our first outreach. I was 24. And uh, I had a friend, his name was Roy, Roy Sapp. He, he came alongside. He was the first one to confirm my calling that, that I'd had of the vision. And he, when I... I talked to him, he's a good friend and is a pastor, uh, not a pastor, but a youth leader. And he was young too, but I felt like he was the one and uh, he, he could be a part of this. So he, he became a part of it. And uh, when we took out our first one, uh, first group is 107. And uh, when we went out on the outreach that, that 58 years ago, then out of this, you know, it, it started to form as people said, how are you going to uh, have help? You need, you need people around you. We didn't use the term eldership. We just talked about spiritual leaders. And I, I was able to see at that time about six others. And they came together and they also created a board because we had to have a legal board and they were one and the same. But, but the interesting thing is, that although you initiated this, and, and of course, the books and the way people talk, it's, it's, it's all about you and Dar, mm -hmm. but you intuitively, or because of your upbringing and your biblical knowledge, you knew you had to be surrounded by other people to be confirmation, didn't you? Oh, it's the word, and the multitude of counselors, their safety. That was the word, and, and that's, that's really important. Well, a lot of people imagine, that if, you're an, if you have an apostolic ministry in, in modern terms, that then you're at the top of the, of the pyramid. But I, I guess you never felt that way, did you? <laughs> it, it, yeah, in fact, it was, it was a concept of a flat chart that I saw in my mind. I, I, I get mental pictures sometimes of, about a communication that God's given me. And, and I, I was thinking about what happens if there's worldwide persecution you know, or one area of the world, and they get caught off and so on. If you also, I, I was thinking about this because some this happened, uh, and that happens in every generation. You see a strong leader, and the enemy takes down the leader, and everything, everything collapses. Falls. Yeah. And so I, I was saying to the Lord at the time, I, whatever happens, I want what you're doing, I want you to guide it, and whatever happens, that it keeps multiplying. Yeah. And that's why people all the time are asking the question, how is it that YWAM is 58 years old and yet they're still growing? In fact, we're growing more now than we've ever grown. I think so. There's life there. Yeah, yeah, it looks why like Why is it. there life? Yeah, Dar, do you have a... Well, I just was gonna make this comment that always, Lauren, 
everything you've done is to try to empower others. Yeah. So no, it would not make sense to put a structure together that didn't empower others. And those early people that you brought around you, they had a knowledge of the mission as a whole and they cared about it as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. So as you would come together, being a part of the early International Council, it was prayer for the mission. I don't think any of your discussions in those early years were around so much structure. It was just how to get the job right. done, how to be accountable to one another. I do remember days of repentance we would have one another. It was, it was, uh, we were trying to needed. move. <laughs> yes, true. We were trying to move together yeah. and be spiritual leaders uh, to lead this movement. But there never was a sense of trying to direct everything or control everything. Yeah, I remember being on our faces in Japan. Yes. The leaders, I memorized several little pieces of gravel on the walk that I was lying on <laughs> <laughs> because I was repenting about misusing designated funds. Yeah. You know, there are fundamental things that, that you know, you weren't doing policies that said you have to do this and don't do this. That's right. We, we were seeking God together and internalized policies came out of it, you know, That's virtue, right. virtue. That's right. Well, the Holy Spirit was teaching us, and at the same time we had godly teachers that were coming in and giving us outside help and pro prophetic uh, teachers and ministries that would come along and help us out. I, I always, uh, so grateful because there, there, was a, there was a foundation laid, and Ephesians 2 says the prophets and the apostles lay the foundation yeah. that's underground that's not a glorious spot yeah, that's right. but when the glory starts to come suddenly i was shocked one day when somebody says you know he's the leader of a whole nation and i thought what i thought the prime minister or the president was you know it it didn't make sense to me yeah. that ywam would think of itself as controlling something over a whole nation but but we did kind of go that way, didn't we? And and, and we I remember a number of conversations with you where, where you were so concerned about it. And actually, I didn't see a way. And, and, and as we converse, I don't think we saw a way through that because we were we were becoming what seemed essential to us, which was more and more organizational. Now we had decentralized the legal side, all these legal entities. And, and different boards and all. But as an organization, we, we were seeing ourselves as an organization. And I can remember strategy conference, even here, where, where I at least really admired other organizations that had, all had five-year plans. Yes. You know, and they worked on them for months and months and months. And then, you know, after that, their five-year plan told them what to do every morning when they got up. Yes. <laughs> you know? yes. and, and we kind of, I think we, we we tried to go that way. It didn't fit us very well. Um, what was your What was your take on that? That, that period of time where, where we were more directors of countries and directors of continents and all this. Uh, were you Were you uneasy about it, Dar? I think our motivation was to do a good job. Yeah. Our motivation was to make sure the pastoral was covered. Our motivation was to move forward. So I don't think that there was ever in our hearts anything to, oh, we'll do it this way so we can control. I don't, yeah. I don't think that was ever there. But the uneasiness for me came was when I would hear, oh, this team uh, wanted to go into such and such a country and they were told they could not. Or uh, uh, there, there was closing doors instead of opening doors. Yeah. And that just seemed so wrong to me. And I couldn't understand in truth why if we're youth with the mission and we know we take risks with young people and everything is about expansion, why wouldn't you want a team from another nation to come into your town? Because you're protecting your reputation. <laughs> yes, that's right. I did hear that one quite a few yeah, that's times. That's right. We have a good reputation here. We don't want young people coming in exactly, and messing up. Exactly, exactly. Or the other one that always got to me, well, we just can't have all these young people because we don't have a lot of full-time staff to help oversee them. And I'd say, hey, wait a minute. Short-termers make long-termers. Maybe those young people need some of your future answers. And Lauren, I remember during that time having a conversation with you um, 
seems a lot of my memories are, are, are me defending something that was, in the end, not defensible. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I capitulated later on. But uh, you were saying you were uneasy with that term director. And I think we were very organizational at the time, and everybody was a director of something. Uh, and, and you said you were uneasy with it, and I said, well, you know, I, I, I granted, it's not the best title. We, we don't direct people, but we're trying to communicate with others and help them understand who we are and what we are. But you were uneasy with it. I got the impression that you knew it wasn't right. And I've never asked you this. Were, did you know what was right and you were holding back until we were ready? Or, do, or were you just aware that we were a little bit off and we needed to make some adjustments? Uh, how do you recall that? Language often will end up directing you according to the language you use. And so I was seeing a drift. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, the one thing I, I determined to do, I took a title at the beginning so that no one else would get it, so they could literally allow for others to, to rise. But I, I passed that on uh, when I was 50, yeah. and, and uh, then it, it began, began to move for, more and more that way as people actually started directing. Yeah. And, and I thought, this is wrong. It should be directed by the Holy Spirit. And the, if, you, if uh, you grew up like I did in a home that sought the Lord about <laughs> almost everything, you know, we just, that's the way we did it. But, uh, and to see us start to move that way, I felt like it was, it was creating a blockage, like a, a small opening in a bottle, you know. Well, you, you can get Tabasco sauce out, but you don't want to pour it out too much. But it's, it's different if you want to pour out a, a glass of water. So when, when you have more and more directors, we're, we're going to close off the expansion God wants, and that's every, every nation and then every creature. Yeah, and I was very aware that I was one of those blockages because I, I rose from director of this to director of that, director of this to be director of Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And what happens then is everybody who has a problem they don't want to deal with pushes it up to you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and really, you, if I had been in the air and at airports and meeting with people with problems constantly, full time, I still wouldn't have touched 10% of the issues in, in, in my area of the world. So it, it really was a bottleneck. Well, that, that's, that's what happened is we went organizational. And then and something happened. I think, I think we'll take a little break and then we'll come back to what began to open it back up. When you do, be sure to include the issue of justice. How do you handle oh. justice <laughs> with such a narrowness of leadership? Okay, let's take a break and come back to that and we'll talk about our sorrows and woes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 